good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to speak on the idea of equality as rhetoric, because I actually do believe that if we look at the way the state has enacted policies, and referring to Jeff's previous presentation, that in fact Ireland is actually quite a, what I would call a careless state. And I don't believe, and the evidence doesn't suggest that that is a new phenomenon. It was exacerbated in the Celtic Tiger, but it is not entirely new. So I'm going to talk about economic inequality and why it's so pervasive, why it's good for health, and particularly I'm going to talk about the dismantling of the equality infrastructure of the state in the last ten, seven or eight years, which I think is extremely serious in terms of its implication for the monitoring of injustice and for holding the state to account. Because if we don't have institutions that hold the state to account, then how can these issues be made public? And I'm then going to talk about the problem, not the idea, and I was very struck by your last presentation, uh, of charity. Because I'm going to talk about the dangers of the ideology of charity, not the practice of charity, but the dangers of the ideology of charity, which I think are highly pervasive, not just in the NGO sector where people do charitable works and very valuable work, but within the statutory machinery of the state, where many people view rights not as something that people have, but a gift that's given by those who are providing the services. Uh, can people see this? Can you see it? Well, this is a very important table, in my view. It's from the Central Statistics Office, and it goes back to summarize maybe the point that Jeff has just made. This is the study of income and living conditions in Europe. This is the Irish data. This shows people divided into 10 categories. Uh, the lowest income group are on the left, and the highest income group are at the top. As you can see from, the, from 2009 to 2010, those at the lowest income had a deficit in their uh, actual equivalent disposable income of 26%. So in the middle of the crisis, we did not support the vulnerable. And I think it is a lie for any politician to claim otherwise. It has, that policy has been sustained by the current government. This is the previous government. And as you can see, amazingly, the top 10% had actually an increase of 8% of disposable income in the midst of the crisis. I mean, if that is not an indictment of a government and the state in relation to inequality, I don't know what is. So there is no getting away from that. This is not ideology, and I want to take up this notion, because when people like, who may be from the Vincent de Paul or myself or others like, criticize the state and we say you're doing this, we are told we are being ideological. And I think that is a very dangerous statement. There is no view from nowhere. The status quo is ideological. Everything has ideology, everything has a set of values, everything comes from a position. There is no view from nowhere. And the reason I find all this amazing is it isn't that we don't have evidence. This is a very well-known study. Those of us we have, it's a very study of rich countries by the health, um, uh, public health, um, uh, their economists and analysts and um, uh, Wilkinson and Pickett in the UK. And they study down the left I probably can't see the countries, so I'll just tell you. The countries with the very high income, but also the highest poor indicators of health and social welfare in terms of life expectancy, maths and literacy attainment, infant mortality, murder, homicide, imprisonment, unwanted teenage pregnancy, low trust, high levels of obesity, rising mental illness, including drug and alcohol abuse, and low social mobility, are not poor countries in, within the rich countries. They're one of the wealthiest countries, the United States. It's up at the top. High income inequality, but also very coming down at the bottom in all these indicators. We are down here in the middle, just above Greece, I suspect. We've moved up the gradient up towards the United States since this data was collected in 2006. And down here, a lot of people don't realize that economically, maybe not in gender terms, certainly, uh, Japan remains one of the healthiest and the most equal country in the world. Next, of course, in Europe to the Northern European countries. So we can't say we don't have evidence. We know that more equal societies are more sustainable. 
We know they're better for people's health. We know they're better for children. Even things down to, they did an analysis of bullying in schools. It's lower in countries like Sweden and Finland than it is significantly lower than in the UK. Child well-being is better in more equal countries. Again, here we see the Northern European countries coming out really well at the top, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark. We're down here to the middle. And down at the bottom, we have the UK, which is very poor. We have the Anglo-Zone. And my, of course, every, Ireland is classified, and people don't want to hear that. Ireland is classified in all international comparisons now as a neoliberal country within the Anglo-Saxon zone. And we are pursuing policies which are disadvantageous to the most vulnerable. And there is national and international data to prove it. But what are we doing? Look at all the, I have a list here of all the equality and related agencies that have been closed. Or the Equality Authority, cut in its budget, merged this year with the uh, Human Rights Commission. The Human Rights Commission. The Gender Equality Unit of the Department of Education closed in the early 2000s. The Higher Education Equality Unit closed 2003. The National Committee on Education Disadvantage. This, to me, was a great scandal. We had a monitoring committee set up under the 1998 Act to monitor disadvantage in education. What did we do? We had it for three years, and then we closed it. What does that say about our concern for equality in education? It says it doesn't matter. That's what it says. Uh, the Centre for Early Childhood Development and Education closed in 2008. Combat Poverty closed. The Women's Health Pri uh, Council, and I served in it for six, seven years, for nothing. All of us worked in it for nothing. They closed it. Uh, the Crisis Pregnancy Agency merged with the HSE. And more seriously, the National Consultative Committee on Racism and Interculturalism was closed at a time when we have huge issues of racism within the country. And not alone. I could go on. The National Women's Council had its budget cut by 38% in 2012. The Gender Equality Desk at the Ministry of Justice, Equality, Law and Reform was closed in 2009. And I want to speak especially of travellers, because I'm godmother, I should say, to travellers, and I'm very interested and looking forward to hear what Judge Riley is going to say, because I am a very, very regular visitor to all prisons for a whole variety of reasons. And I feel that travellers are treated in the most appalling way within the state. It is appalling. Look at the cuts that have that happened to them. We've had 76% cut, for example, to their um, uh, equality organisations, 85% in their accommodation. Effectively, all t uh, travelling teachers, visiting teachers removed. This is the most vulnerable group in the state. This is a group that has the highest, the lowest life expectancy, the highest rate of suicide. And I'm sick and tired, to be honest with you, of all this, what I call this wallowing in misery in the media. Oh, isn't it terrible? We'll have another program in RTE, and we'll all do our voyeurism, and we'll do nothing. Voyeurism is no use. It doesn't, sensationalism in the media doesn't answer the fact that we don't have housing. We house was burned down in this county belonging to travellers. The county I come from, County Clare, has not exactly a wonderful reputation. But what do we do? We close down dissent. We don't take on the issues. Has anybody been prosecuted, by the way, for any of these acts? I'm asking the question because I think it says a lot about how we treat the people who are on the margins. People with Disabilities Ireland, the move. Aging, the Council for Aging as well, and older people has also been closed down. So we have closed down the equality infrastructure of the state. Those are facts. So I think that there's a serious problem. And where does this? I think it's not a new phenomenon. Ireland has a minimalist welfare state. And as I said here, it is classified as a neoliberal state. We have social class segregated schooling. Very recently, maybe some of you were there, I gave the annual address to the Jesuits, education. And I said to them, Christianity is very simple, really. It's love your neighbor as yourself. And that means you do not exclude them from your school because they have no money. Very basic, really. Not really that advanced thinking, you know. So uh, I'm just saying, if people believe this, you know, the same holds true. We exclude other children, in not in the non-fee-paying sector as well. We do it by expensive uniforms. We do it by the way we enroll children. I know this is being addressed and tempted to be addressed, you know, uh, at the moment. But it is a long history. And we are hypocritical as middle-class people, and I speak as one, if we don't realize that, that to have just as quality, there's a cost to us. I'm one of the people who actually did believe they should have cut the salaries of higher people like myself. I don't believe they should ever have been at that level, quite frankly. Um, 
the social class, we had minority segregation for many years. I know it's changing, but it's changing with considerable resistance and often not for the right reasons. It's with the reduction of resources. So you will have uh, children with uh, uh, intellectual disabilities in mainstream, but often they won't have the resources. I'm particularly involved with the Irish Deaf Society and with educating deaf people with a big program in UCD. And they experience enormous problems with mainstreaming. So it's no use saying we can do mainstreaming if you have nobody who knows sing, doesn't speak, you sign, and, and we have no interpreters. Yeah, we have social class segregated healthcare, which is probably the disgrace of the country. It really is a disgrace. And I don't care what, uh, if we look at the history of how that happened. There was a symbiotic relationship between the professions, particularly the medical profession, and the religious institutions of the state for their own interests to institutionalize that. And it has not been addressed. In fact, what we're doing now is we're privatizing it and we're making it for profit. So we have three tiers of health. You have public health for the poor, you have private health, which is non-profit for those in between, and you have for-profit health care. So I'm just saying what has happened is there's a rise, it's a, sh a shift in carelessness. It's a shift to the right. There is no question about that. It is a shift to a neoliberal state. Um, beacon for-profit hospitals. How could the health of humanity be handed over, the health of older people, their care and well-being, be handed over to, in, and children, be handed over to profitable, uh, profit-making institutions. Does nobody read the research literature in these departments? <laughs> and while I am surprised at, and this is where the anti-intellectualism of Irish life is, I'm going to speak about. I remember reading an article when Bupe came into Ireland in the journal of the Social Science and Medicine. And it was very clear that Bupe had been not a great record in the UK in terms of healthcare. Now, we have a lot of people we're supposed to have at the machinery of the state who are experts and advisors and so whatever. So why did we bring, why did we bring this concept into Ireland? Why did we do it? In my view is because people put profit before people. They did, and they put their private personal interests before the good of the majority of people, especially people who can't speak for themselves. But behind this, of course, there is another issue, which is a deeper issue, and it's European. And that is, within Europe, the idea uh, and our resistance to fund people on social welfare properly, which you just referred to, is because our notion of the citizen is of the autonomous citizen, the economically self-sufficient person. And the citizen, as I said here, is equated with work, with employment, but not dependency, even inevitable dependencies. And this I find extraordinary. And this is, I've written about elsewhere in many different contexts, and I've also, by way, a, a paper written for today, and I've sent it to Joe Mulholland on this. But caring and being are not citizenship-defining ways of living. You know, so you're not really a full citizen if you're dependent, but most of us are dependent for very significant portions of our lives. When we're children, we're largely dependent for many, many years, nowadays up to 17 or 18. We're dependent as well when we get very old, if we live long enough and we become unwell or we are not able to mind ourselves. So dependency is endemic to the human condition. Other people are dependent because for a whole variety of reasons, they haven't developed the care infrastructure in their lives, they have mental health issues, they have alcohol issues, they have all kinds of other problems. So dependency is inevitable. And we cannot define welfare as if it is a sin to be dependent. And that, I think, has happened. You've had cuts to one parent and family allowance. I don't care what anybody says to me. Those job activation measures for people who, um, who will, on average, be in low-paid jobs, we've just heard it, will not be able to afford to work because they won't be able to afford childcare. And they will do what happened with the American Res Responsibilities Act in 1996 that was passed in the United States. The same ideology, get single mothers out to work. Well, what has happened is, of course, that people haven't have to work because they starve if they don't, and they have very huge problems in relation to childcare. But it is this idea, oh, you're not valuable unless you have, you're in employment. Even the changing the notion of employment assistance, that is, we will assist you while you are in a transition state, maybe a longer term state, when you cannot get work. Now it's called job secrets allowance. What does that say? It says you must be getting a job. And it says that is what you are supposed to do. Even disability, I see numerous emerging critiques of it in the media. Oh, maybe the reason we have lower unemployment is because we have too many people on disability. 
or maybe a lot of people are disabled and not able to work for a whole variety of reasons, not all of which may be obvious physical ones. So I'm saying here there's a whole mentality uh, which denies the fact that dependency and interdependency are endemic to the human condition. And this has been exacerbated with neoliberalism. And neoliberalism is a phenomenon. It is not an ideology. It is very well documented. There's a wonderful new book just published in the United States called Discipline the Poor, which actually goes into great detail on its, uh, its reality. So I'm saying now we have created a new kind of state where the citizen is not, is not redefined as customers. The Department of Education has a customer service website. There's customer services in the health sector. What do you mean? A customer is somebody who is engaged in the market and buys a service on a pay-as-you-go. They are not citizens. So the state, by its language, is redefining the relationship between people and the, and the state. So I'm just saying cuts to public services. There's a whole use of nomenclature and language to actually create an image as if change is good, even if change is, in fact, a way our masquerading language is used, like regenerating housing estates. How do you regenerate poverty? You move poor people somewhere else, they're still poor. You know, our governance through diktat, this whole notion, we consult with you and then ignore you. So I think there's a whole use of language here, a language which is deceptive at the level of the state and especially at the level of politics. I have to say, finally, because I have to finish, I believe that an ideology of charity, uh, not justice, dominates public discourse. And I think there are serious problems with that because it pervades, it's not that I object to people having charitable institutions. And that is not what I'm saying. I'm saying when the equality legislation was passed in this country, for example, in 98 and 2000, within two years, within, by 2003, the Equal Status Act would change at the pressure of the licensed vintners to make sure that people couldn't go to the Equality Tribunal, they had to go to the courts in relation to accessing services to vindicate their rights. And what that did and showed was they did not want, the vested interests within this state did not want people to have access to amenable institutions to vindicate their rights in terms of accessing services, including public services. So I'm just saying behind that is this char charity ideology uh, of the deserving and undeserving poor. I think it's still there, it's very strong. I'm not saying that middle class people are not suffering in the recession, they are. But the poorest people, people like travellers, people who are migrants, Roma for example, who are Roma women, are subject and well documented by the Rad Migrant Centre under this new, in my view, dreadful legislation, the Public Order Act, where you, know, you have something like aggressive begging. Who defines what aggressive begging actually is? So these people have fallen off the edge, but really we don't care about them. The people on direct provision, you still have 19 euros 50 and 960 since the year 2000. That is a shame. It is a shame on the country that people are treated like that. So I'm saying behind it is this charity. Oh, we'll give money to the third world. We'll give them clothes we don't need, computers that don't work. Oh, we're very generous. And I think it's driven by this desire for moral recognition, not by the rights of those who receive. It services the guilt of the better off, not the needs of the vulnerable. And it doesn't challenge injustices. And moreover, I think that mentality exacerbates inequality. It gives the impression something has been done. It gives people a feeling of moral superiority. Oh, I'm very generous. I go out on a Friday night and I do something for the poor. Big deal. Go and pay your taxes and the poor won't need you on a Friday night. Sorry. You know. So I think I'm not saying that people, and I have been involved, in, involved myself in voluntary organizations which are charities. But I think charity, if it becomes the mechanism for actually institutionalizing welfare within the state, it would, uh, is based on institutional economic injustices. And it absolves the state from responsibility, and people can retain, retain their privileges with moral impunity as they have engaged in charitable acts. And I think it provides a very convenient avenue when the travelers come and you can give them, you know, what you don't want in the fridge uh, for assuaging your own guilt. So I think that we need to take a mirror and look at ourselves, the middle classes, the privileged classes, those of us who are better off, because we have created the state. And I would argue as well, I don't have time here, that the um, professions, the legal profession, the, uh, particularly the medical profession in the healthcare sector, you know, there have been absolutely instrumental in ensuring that we have an unequal country. And they have protected their vested interests, and I would include it, you know, the academy among it, that we have protected our vested interests often at the cost. And I believe it, it's 
this posy consensualism, which was here in the, uh, in the uh, social partnership area, it masquerades. In the academy, it masquerades as objectivity. If you are uh, a feminist, or if you're a socialist, or if you're a communist, or if you're even completely right-wing, you're ideological. But those of us who are in the middle have no ideology. That is absurd. You have the ideology of the status quo, which is about maintaining your own privilege. And I'm saying that I believe one of the major problems culturally, if I may say so, is there is no space in this country for critical social scientific thinking. You look at the Irish Times, it has a science correspondent, it has no social science correspondent. If you produce a, a book on any literary work, I heard the other day somebody on the radio when I was coming up, some book that was written, and there was going to be a program on it, the arts program. There's no program where we have scientific evidence that says we will discuss this book, for example, because this book matters, because it is an important social scientific work. We don't have that in this country. And I believe there's an enormous intellectual lacuna in that area that needs to be addressed. We've no sociology, no politics, no philosophy uh, in secular level schools. And therefore, I think that's another part of the problem. Instead of that, we, we talk and we have science and we have arts and humanities, and there's a massive gap in the middle. I think that needs also to be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you.